Aloha, welcome to today's edition of Life in the Law. My name is Carol Mon Lee. We have a very special show today with two law students from the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law, uh, Emily, Emily Gaskin, and Christina Lizzie, and both are third year law students who are working toward their environmental law certificate. And uh, this week is an extremely special week here in Hawaii because of the IUCN World Conservation Congress. And so tell us all about it and your involvement in it. And so let's see, Christina, you're gonna tell us about the IUCN? Sure, yes, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. We're both very excited. And we're very excited that the IUCN is finally here. We've been working um, since, well, Emily's been working since last December uh, on that. And many people have been working well before that. So the IUCN Congress uh, brings together the IUCN's 1,300 members uh, to discuss members of important uh, matters of importance to its members and develop its environmental policy going forward. And the IUCN, I know that your viewers have may have been following already, but it's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it's comprised of both uh, governmental actors and also non-governmental actors. So we have states and NGOs in the same room coming up with the, really the international conservation agenda. And that will hopefully move forward. And these decisions that are made at this Congress then perhaps will move forward, eventually becoming conventions and treaties and really becoming hard law in the future. So this next couple of weeks are really important, or this next week is really important to what uh, the world's conservation agenda will be. And so how many members are there of the IUCN? There are about 1,300 members. Um, the majority of those are non-governmental organizations, and the rest are, of course, states. And how often does it meet? It meets every three years. So is this the first time in Hawaii, this, I understand? Yes, this is the first time in Hawaii and the first time in the United States, actually. Great. And how many are participating? How, how many people are coming to Hawaii? Oh, we've heard the numbers are up to around 9,000 now. Great. And I know we have a special visitor as part of the IUCN. Yes, so we are hoping, there have been different reports, but we are hoping that uh, President Obama may be addressing us tomorrow at the opening of the ceremonies. Okay, great. So, Emily, tell us a little bit more about the law school's involvement in the IUCN, and particularly your class. Absolutely, and I would like to thank you on behalf of the law school um, for having us here today. The law school became an official member of the IUCN uh, this past October, so in October of 2015. And as a, as a member, uh, the law school had the opportunity, or the environmental law program had the opportunity to draft motions that could be submitted and, as Christina described, eventually become law. And at that time, um, our associate dean, Denise Antolini, uh, assembled a, a group of students and we began the process of working with communities here in Hawaii to try and identify what issues were important to us and what motions we wanted to draft for the IUCN. And um, that process took several months and we worked with a number of stakeholders uh, here in Hawaii and ended up writing seven different motions on a range of environmental issues, including marine debris, community-based natural resource management, um, a number of other issues. Climate change, of course, is a big issue that we wanted to address here in Hawaii. And um, we were able to submit those motions to an electronic portal in, uh, in February of 2016. And this was a very uh, unique year for the IUCN. In the past, all of the voting has occurred at the actual meeting. Uh, this year, however, they made the decision that the the non-controversial motions would actually get voted on ahead of time through an electronic voting process. And so uh, this class of students at the law school had the really unique opportunity to participate in this electronic voting. And in doing so, we were able to learn about all of the different issues that uh, were being proposed around the world and really look in depth at what issues matter to us in Hawaii and also meet with our stakeholders to determine what issues matter to them as well. I see. So how many motions altogether? You said Hawaii's drafted seven. And worldwide, how many motions have been proposed? Worldwide, there were approximately 125 motions that were drafted. Only 91, I believe, were accepted 
um, to move on to the next stage of voting. And there were many reasons for that. Um, some motions were merged, some motions addressed issues that had already been uh, covered, and some issues were just outside of the spectrum of, of what the IUCN wanted to address. I see, and so of the 91 motions, you said 91. I believe that's the number, it's in there. Right, so how many did the law school get to vote on in advance? Uh, we had the opportunity to vote on all of them. So oh. in the spring, we were joined by a number of a uh, couple new students, including Christina, and we divided the motions up amongst ourselves just based on our personal interests, and then we had the opportunity to, to look in depth at those issues. I see. So you said, though, that the motions usually, the ones that were voted on in advance were the non-controversial ones, but... So there were, I believe, 13 motions mm -hmm. that are going to move forward, and they're going to be voted on on the floor at the Congress. And so we'll be able to play a role in that process as well. Um, we've, we've also looked into those issues, and as a class, we've divided them amongst ourselves. And so we will be a participating in, in the motions assembly process, and we'll have the opportunity to stand up and speak to those motions on uh, next week. I see. How exciting. So does the law school just get one vote? Yes, the law school only gets one vote. <laughs> so as a group, we had to come to a consensus about uh, how we wanted to vote on each motion, but we've we've had quite a lot of opportunities to meet this semester, and I think we are all in agreement about um, how we want to vote on each of those motions. So, how many students are there? Is, is Professor Antolini also participating in the vote? And we also had Professor she, Foreman on uh, Think Tech last week. So, do other professors get to vote too? Part participate in the voting. Uh, Professor Foreman has certainly been involved in this process, uh, but particularly with regards to the motions and the voting, it will be Dean Antolini and one of the students at each of the votes. Okay. And so each one of us will have the opportunity to stand up there and speak about a motion. Great. So now I want to spend a little time about these specific motions, particularly the ones, the seven, that uh, Hawaii and UH has been involved in. So how did you determine which topics to draft motions on? It was really a collaborative process. Um, the, we initially met as a group, and the, the students who were participating in this class come from a wide range of backgrounds, and a lot of us had experience working in environmental conservation here in Hawaii already. And so based on our knowledge, we, we brainstormed some ideas that we thought would be important to move forward. And then next, we reached out to the other members here in Hawaii, as well as organizations that may not be IUCN members, but who still wanted a say in drafting this international soft law, this policy. And so uh, it was, we through many meetings and uh, with stakeholders, we were able to whittle this list down to the seven that move forward. Okay. Zuri, can we show the uh, seven motions, maybe one page with the four motions first, and let's just go through the topics because sure. it's very interesting. Yes, okay, so while we pull that up, mm -hmm. so Christina, I know you were involved in two of the motions more in more detail, is that right? I was, and I can speak mostly to uh, 71. I joined the class after the motions were drafted. Mm -hmm. Some, and so I really, my role was more helping in moving the motion through the voting process and reaching out to our stakeholders and the other, the others who had been involved in the process and then trying to generate more support uh, during the electronic motions vote. Okay, well let's talk about, so here are four of the seven motions. The first motion says, motion 51 is international biofouling. And it's very funny, when I first saw that I said, isn't that a typo? Is it biofueling? <laughs> but it's biofouling. So Christina, were you uh, did you had you I should actually allow Emily to take that <laughs> on, but uh, I'll just say I know biofouling. <laughs> so it's whenever uh, there are barnacles and things like that that attach to uh, stationary objects and then objects that are moving through the ocean and they get carried mm -hmm. into different areas. Mm -hmm. And Emily can explain more. <laughs> so this is one of the environmental issues that results from globalization. And in an increasingly connected world, we have more trade. We have boats going back and forth across the ocean. And exactly as Christina explained, what happens is things attach to boats. And when boats travel from harbor to harbor, those marine species will travel with the boat and will be released at the next harbor. And that is one of the ways that invasive species get introduced to Hawaii and get spread around the planet. And this is something that we're particularly concerned about as, a, as an island, as an island community, because we're very vulnerable to invasive species. 
And so when something new comes in, it can completely take over an ecosystem. And um, it's something that we need to be aware of. Now, there are steps being taken by the Department of Land and Natural Resources, as well as um, some federal agencies here, here on the islands, to, to address these issues. But when we were reviewing uh, the IUCN motions from past years, we noticed that this was not something that had been elevated to the international level. And so we thought that it, as an issue that would impact all members, or at least all members with a coastline, uh, we thought this would be particularly important. Can you give us examples of some of these um, things that attach to, you said, the bottoms of the ships and... You know, a lot of the things that attach aren't particularly sexy. They're, uh -huh. they're algae and they're, um, you know, different types of bacteria. And so they might not seem like a big deal, but when they come into a new environment, with a different temperature and a different acidity, they have the opportunity to proliferate, and that can be um, a major problem. Damaging I mean, the, the environment. Yes. Do we have examples that you can give us of the, some of the damage that's happened, either here in Hawaii or in other places? I don't know a specific <laughs> example. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to think of what. Um, let me think marine of debris, I know we have an example, Motion 52 is on marine debris. Is that related to Motion 51? Uh, they're not related, but that oh. is the motion that I primarily worked on, so I can, I can speak so in depth Let's talk about to Motion, motion. 51, 52. Uh, so Motion 52 addresses issues of, of marine debris, and this was actually a really interesting uh, process that we went through to develop this motion. My background is uh, in ocean policy, and I've spent the last eight years working uh, for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, this is an issue that we were very much aware of um, doing marine conservation and marine policy. And so when we first started discussing at the law school, we decided this was something that we certainly wanted to move forward with. Um, we, have, we have many problems with, with marine debris, both marine debris that comes from the land, and so things that will travel in through the Alawai Canal, for example, and through runoff, but we also have problems from marine debris that comes from boats, so things that are discarded out at sea. And what we're now beginning to realize is that marine debris is becoming concentrated in these ocean gyres. In uh, ocean gyre, it basically a circulation pattern in the ocean that causes um, that causes plastic to all come together in one area, and what. Uh, scientists have become to identify are these things called Pacific o or ocean patches. And they're, they're existing all over the world. The Great Pacific Ocean Patch is the one that we might hear about the most in the media. Uh, but this is something that... How, how big is that one? It's very large. I don't it's know. About the size of Texas. The size of Texas. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, and this is obviously something that's a huge problem. Um, there are a number of negative impacts. The the plastics, when they become concentrated, they, they break down and they can be ingested by the larger marine mammals, obviously causing um, you know, uh, health problems and even death. Uh, but they can also be uh, consumed by smaller organisms. Mm -hmm. And we are part of a food chain that consumes smaller organisms as they get uh, eaten and moved up the food chain. So it's something that we need to be concerned about as well. So what's the... Uh, Right now, Motion 52, has that been voted on already, or is that one yes. of those that are coming on? Oh. Yes, yeah, so the, the motion was voted on um, through the electronic voting process. And we actually learned this morning, and this is some really exciting news, that all seven of the motions that the law school proposed uh, were all approved through the electronic voting process. So they uh, are not going to officially pass until September 6th uh, when they get uh, brought forth before for the Congress, but uh, we know that that, that, that uh, motion is going to go forward. That's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting. Well, before we get into more motions, I'm going to take a short break now. This is Think Tech Hawaii, Carol Monley with my special guests, Emily Gaskin and Christina Lizzie from the UH William S. Richardson School of Law, and they're here to speak about the IUCN World Congressional Congress. We'll be right back. Hey, how you doing? Uh, okay. Welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lang. I'm your co-host. Okay. Yeah. So and we have a nice about. program here every Friday at oh, 1 o'clock on uh, Think Tech that's Studios that's where we talk about uh, technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. <laughs> so join us if you can. You're going to put me on where? Aloha. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. 
Um, we are here to show you news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, and how it's shaped the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Likeable Science. Welcome back, this is Carol Mon Lee with my special guests Emily Gaskin and Christina Lizzie from UH Richardson School of Law. And we're talking about these motions that the University of Hawaii Law School students drafted. And um, we had a great announcement that this morning you found out that all seven motions have been passed, is that the word? They all passed, we're very excited with that news and so they're all gonna be moving forward. Moving forward before the entire Congress? They'll, they'll be presented to the entire Congress on September 6th, and we anticipate that they'll be passed on that day. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other motions we wanted to talk about was motion number 72. So, there it is, Zuri. Aloha Challenge plus Challenge, Model for Sustainable Development. So, Christina, can you tell us about that one? Sure, I can speak a little that bit mean? to that one, and then also on community-based resource mm -hmm. management. Um, so, Aloha Plus was really looking at the model for sustainability that the state has put forward and then how we can move that and how it can be used as a model for the general um, the general world really so we're calling on IUCN members to recognize the way that Aloha Plus challenge has worked in the state and then to implement it in their own countries and specifically how does it do that uh, it set a number of goals and targets uh, one of the really um, innovative things is it has a tracking system online they can go and uh, see the updates at any time about where the state is at on some of its progress towards its goals. So, uh, and who monitors it? Um, that, I, I cannot speak as well to okay. this one. This is one of my colleagues who uh -huh. focused on this particular okay. motion. Uh, one of the ones that I, I did spend more time on was number 71, the community-based natural resource management. And that, one of the groups that we worked with on that was KUA, and they have... They, KUA. KUA, yeah, uh, Kevin Chang played a large role, uh, coordinated with him a lot on that. And community-based natural resource management supports communities pursuing community-based management and subsistence fishing practices. And it really recognizes um, the importance of grounding resource management in the community and really recognizing the values of the community. So here in Hawaii, that includes Kuleana and Aloha Aina. And so this motion calls on member states and NGOs in particular to look to Hawaii as an example and also to call and um, acknowledge how well these systems are working and to encourage the state of Hawaii to continue to pursue community-based fish, uh, fisheries management and community-based natural resource management in general. Mm -hmm. So on a state level beyond the Congress, how is it being implemented beyond Mm -hmm. What's been done up to now? Is it taken over? Is it under DLNR or? It is something that's under DLNR. So one of the impetuses for this was the ha the Haena on Kauai, their community-based subsistence fishery, that I believe was went into effect in 2014 or a few years ago at least, and that is the regulations are established under the Department of Land and Natural Resources, but they're developed through community input process and really grounded in the community's values. And so we're looking at how that model can be expanded throughout the state and other fisheries. How do you get the community involved? Is it through local organizations, through uh, volunteer? Mm. What, how do you do that? I believe the ideal situation would be that the community itself comes forward and says, we have a resource in this community that needs to be protected and needs to be managed in a certain way. In particular with fisheries, there are communities that come forward and say, they've fishermen that have noticed the depletion of resources and would like to see the, the fishery uh, managed in a different way. And so they, they come forward. Um, so ideally, because it's community-based, it shouldn't be an outside right. stimulus other than recognizing that this is now a model that can be followed. Right. So was the motion itself uh, drafted with the help of these community groups? Uh, this one in particular was drafted with um, KUA, as I mentioned, right. as well as uh, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance, the Council 
Let me look right here. The, con uh, the Conservation Council for Hawaii, as well as Conservation International and the Environmental Law Program. We also had a partner with the Northern Australia Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so once it was drafted, and those were some of the co-sponsors who helped move this forward. Right, so these are partners with, um, uh, on, on all of your motions, did you have partners? Yes, yeah, so all of the motions you needed. Emily, how many did we need to move? At least five to propose a motion, but then uh, sometimes there were, there were more for different reasons. And how did you get these partners? I think one way that Emily mentioned was there was a general call to the community at the very beginning I about see. what kinds of motions should move forward. And so some of these ideas came from the from community members and from other organizations as well, and law students helped in the drafting. I see. So it's not just members of the IUCN who participate in the drafting of the motions or the decisions about which motions. That is correct, although for a, a motion to be proposed, we needed at least five members. Of the IUCN. Of the IUCN. And we actually had a very unique experience uh, with the marine debris motion because in drafting that motion, uh, we came to learn that the government of Australia was actually in the process of drafting a very similar motion. And we, we didn't get the news in time, and so we both submitted our own motions independently. But the IUCN actually took the initiative to merge our motions and to bring us together through this process. And so we ended up having, I think, over a dozen partners. Uh, on this motion because of the support that they received as well as the support that we received here in Hawaii. So which language was used? Was it our motion, the Hawaii motion, or their The language, language was actually merged, which was really neat to see. Uh, and then through the online voting process, there was actually an opportunity to continue to refine the language. There was a comment period that allowed people to uh, make amendments to the language. And so now, the, the motion looks similar to what uh, was similarly or was originally, originally proposed, proposed, but it definitely contains language uh, both from our motion, from Australia's motion, and from input from around the world. So, did the seven motions from Hawaii get a lot of input in terms of redrafting language in, in addition to this one? There were small changes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things was on the community based natural resource management in, in the state of Hawaii, uh, there was uh, a little bit of going back and forth with the Department of State over the language uh, regarding self-determination, whether because we had some of the apology resolution language and they're recognizing the apology resolution from the United States uh, to the, uh, the Native Hawaiians, Hawaiians. And there was some, some going back and forth and ultimately I believe the overthrow of the government of Hawaii was changed to the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii, something see. like that. But mm -hmm. there was a few changes. And then I believe Emily had an interesting one with marine debris and litter. Well, that was interesting. Uh, the uh, Department for the Government of Belgium actually proposed the use of the word litter instead of debris. Uh, and this is just something that happens, is being part of sort of a global conversation on these issues. Um, and is there a difference? Well, I think, I think there's difference in how people interpret and understand the term. Um, litter may be a, a larger, encapsulate more um, items, but in the end, we actually decided that, or the IUCN decided to use both terms. And so now in the title, you'll see litter in parentheses um, after the full title. Ah, do we have that one? Um, what number was that one? It's um, motion. Ma marine debris. Uh, 52, yeah. I, I apologize, on the slide you, yeah. you have a much abbreviated version of the entire <laughs> title. I was trying to save space. Okay, great. Now I know there's another one that you worked on, Emily, which was Motion 85. I well, both of you did, huh? I, neither of us actually worked on it, but we can, we can definitely it. talk about it mm -hmm. a little bit. And that one is on environmental courts and tribunals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you may be aware, uh, Hawaii instituted an environmental court last year in July 2015, and it's one of the second in the nation. And so we're very proud of that. Very proud, yes. And Professor and Dean Antolini has been very involved in the World Conservation, sorry, the World Council on no Environmental Law. Law. And they have really been putting forward different ways to promote these environmental courts throughout the world in order to permit, promote the environmental rule of law. And so this motion really is recognizing that there's been a proliferation of these courts across the world. I believe we're up to about 1,200 now. 650 of those are actually in China, and <laughs> they recently have been re overhauling some of their environmental environmental laws. 
But it's also recognized that the way these courts play out and tribunals play out in different countries are, is very different. So we need different models and some guidance from uh, the WCEL on how to move forward. And so this motion essentially recognizes the important role that environmental courts and tribunals play and then encourages the development of a document or a working group that can provide guidance. I see. I know you're going to spend the spring semester in India, right? At I will the, be, yes. Is that yes. part of the International Environmental Court process? Uh, it, no. it is in a way related. The, um, the opportunity really arose because of the uh, connection between the Hawaii Supreme Court here and the Indian National Green Tribunal and subsequently the, Inter the Indian Supreme Court. So the Indian National Green Tribunal is their country's uh, environmental court. And as Hawaii was developing theirs, they, um, I, believe Chief, or I believe Justice Wilson met with Chief Justice uh, Swatantar Kumar, who is the chairperson of the uh, National Green Tribunal. And there was also a close connection with Jindal Global Law School, which is in the near vicinity of the NGT. And so I'll have the honor of uh, spending a semester at Jindal and then hopefully also uh, interning at the National Green Tribunal. Great. And I know you're both uh, in line for your environmental law certificates mm -hmm. when you graduate. So we just have a few minutes left. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you both see or uh, understand as being the biggest challenge for our environmental um, life here in Hawaii and around the world? Uh, I guess I'll start out. I had the, the honor and privilege of hearing Ben Bauer speak last night, who is the commissioner, the head of the uh, World Conservation, World Council on Environmental Law. I'm going to keep saying it wrong. It's WCEL of the IUCN. And he was talking about the role of environmental law and the role of environment, the R-U-L-E, the role, um, the importance of it, and that we really need to have all of our aspirations really grounded in the law and then also have those laws enforced in courts. And so I believe it's really taking some of these policies and grounding them in the law and then on the ground being able to enforce them. Take action, yeah. actually implement them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, I wanted to thank you both for such a in-depth um, analysis of what the motions are for Hawaii, but also your role in, in helping us in Hawaii participate uh, have real hands-on involvement and understand what's going on and we look forward to both of you continuing your work in environmental law. So if you have a parting message to our audience. Well, I understand that there's still come on the day passes available to come out to the mm -hmm. IUCN. So if you are interested, I encourage you to try and come out and spend a day. There are going to be some really incredible presentations and some wonderful people there. So it would be great. great if you could join us. Yes. And thank you both. So thank, thank you, Christina. You. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Good luck in the Congress, and we look forward to hearing more about our motions in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Aloha. Aloha.